Hello and welcome to the Transmission Podcast. For more information on Transmission and what we do, you can head over to our website. The link for our website can be found in the show notes or the YouTube description down below. Enjoy this session and thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully, hopefully this session will be a bit more interactive. Again, so what we want to do now is we want to, you're going to be doing a similar exercise for homework and next week. Um, And uh, may maybe to say this is that ultimately what you want to do, so whenever, whenever, you, whenever you need to understand God's word, but specifically whenever you are doing a talk, so if you're going to be doing a talk somewhere, the exercise is one where you take the tools, you apply it to your passage. The desire is to get to to a point where you in, can in one sentence say, this is, the, this is the big idea or the main point. This is the big idea or the main point of the passage. This is the big thing. There's lots of things that God is, of course, saying. But what is the big one thing to which everything that God is saying in this passage, sort of how does it, how can I sort of in a succinct way sort of combine those things, ties those things together? And it's a very helpful exercise in, in communication to be able to, to, to state that as one sentence, one point, one big idea. Because really when you're preaching then or when you're teaching then, everything that you're doing is really just communicating that one thing. In a sense then, and this is what we, we would call a sermon skeleton or a talk skeleton, is you taking all your tools, you're applying it to the passage, you end up being able to say it in one sentence. That sentence then you might decide that you want a structure, you might decide that you want to break it up into two points or three points or four or five or how many things, but it's still one big idea that you're communicating. And that one big idea, everything in a talk is really communicating that one thing. You, you, you will, you, you'll probably have an introduction which introduces that thing. And then you'll be opening up the Bible and explaining to people to show them everything as it relates to that thing. And then you might have, as, as, as was mentioned earlier, you might decide that you want to explain it a bit better by means of illustration. But ultimately what you're illustrating is that thing. You want to make sure you be illustrating that. And you want to apply to how does, how does this passage that we're looking at, how is it speaking to you and me in our everyday life? What is God calling us to do or to live differently to? Well, you're applying your, that, that main idea. And you want to make sure, even if you're in the Old Testament, that you're proclaiming the gospel, because everything is ultimately about Jesus. And how does the gospel relate to that, that big idea? So in a sense, everything that's happening in your talk is, is honed in on one big idea. And what we're doing now in the tools is trying to be able to condense it to that one main point, that one sentence. Any questions on that? Any? any? Okay. We're going to do that now together, hopefully. Um, so if you can open up your, passage, uh, your, your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14 to 16. The reason why we're doing this now here, this passage, and we did this, one or two of you were there last year, is because it's a nice short passage, just three verses, and we can hopefully get through three verses in an hour, hopefully. And, um, and it helps us to get through lots of the different tools. Okay, so that's why we're going to do this one. So if someone can read for us Hebrews Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. So that's your passage. You've been given this to do in a Bible study or as a talk. So you're sitting in your study now, and you want to interpret Hebrews chapter 4, 14 to 16. Somebody read it for us. Therefore, stop, stop. The first thing you do before you read it is you pray. So will you pray and then read for us? You ask, No, seriously. You ask, Lord... Lord, you have spoken, but I 
I cannot understand if you don't open up my eyes. And I, I need to be fed so that I can feed others now. Sorry, so you pray that first. Sure. <laughs> uh, Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for this very personal revelation that you've given us that we may know you better. We just pray, Lord, that as we come to it now, that uh, you would give us humble hearts, mm. um, that we would seek to know you more first for ourselves, and Lord, that you would reveal to us what it is that you are saying uh, in these verses, that we would be encouraged, that you pray necessary, Father, and that we would be encouraged. Amen. Amen. And then you read it first. Cool. Therefore, since we have a, a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, <coughs> let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, weaknesses. We have, we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our power. Amen. Amen. And by the way, you pray beforehand and you pray the whole time through. Okay? And you often gonna like cry, like, Lord, what is going on here? Okay, and that's very normal. Okay, so remember you're sitting in your study, this is your passage that you're going to be doing a talk on or you're going to be leading a Bible study. You've prayed, you've read it. Now you're sitting probably, you've probably printed out it all in your Bible and you've got different highlighters or pens with you. I think it's always helpful to do that. Remember now, the very first thing that we do is exegesis. So back to the previous thing, exegesis. And as you think exegesis, remember the formula, you think I have to consider the context and the content. Okay, so now we start with the context. As I'm considering context, I've got historical context to consider and literary context. So that's what we want to do. Okay, so firstly then, this is difficult because you didn't know you're going to be interpreting Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16 tonight. So in a perfect world, you would be sitting now with Google on, probably not Google, maybe, or, or whatever software you're using, commentaries, you want to be sitting with commentary. So in a sense, this exercise can't work perfectly in an hour because I'm sitting with the answers and you don't. Okay. But we're going to try because we, it's the process that we want to, we want to think through the right categories. So do, do any of you um, know anything about the historical context of the book of Hebrews because that's now the first, that's the first thing that you need to do. What is the world into which this book was written? Just a quick question before yes. Um, you just mentioned commentaries. If you're going through this process of using these tools, does it not kind of, I don't know, like do the work for you already if you read a commentary? Yes. Um, while doing this, or is Brilliant. it you do after you've had your time alone? Yes, uh, you do it after. For, for, for most parts of it. So I don't look at commentaries. I, only time when I look at commentaries is when I really get stuck with there's a particular thing that I wonder about, like a granular thing, or there's a particular thing that I wonder, then I'll dip into a commentary. Because otherwise, you're right, otherwise you get muddled up with somebody else's interpretation often. So I agree with you on that. But there's certain, there's certain specific things where I can sit... And even, and I'm not saying this irreverently, I can sit and pray for like a thousand hours, but I'm not going to understand, you know, what was first century Ephesus like. Mm -hmm. You know, there's guys for 2,000 years that have done PhDs on Ephesus. And so I want to stand on the shoulders of other believers who've done the work of understanding the world into which it was written. So for historical context, I would, I would dip into a commentary, um, you know, but it's different to like reading through the whole thing, you know, there's, so you, you be wise on that. It's a good question. But historical context, anyone, so that, remember that's the first thing you don't want to do. What's the world into which the book and thus the passage was written into? Does any of you know any, any, anything about Hebrews? Oh, great. We're coming to you now. Huh? I think the, um, yeah, it's, 
he's writing to Jewish uh, believers mainly. And, uh, Hence the name Hebrews. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 it's a good one. You're right. Yes, and um, there's like pressure to somehow revert back to Judaism and uh, undergoing persecution. So this author is writing to say that, wait, you're actually going back to something lesser. And showing the, the exaltedness of Jesus Christ and why he's superior to the old Jewish religion. Okay. Good. Anyone wants to add to that? I'll, I'm going to comment on it. Between the Jewish and the, the old well, the yes. Testament yes. and the New Testament. Yeah. Actually torn between those yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. They, they were in between and they yeah. didn't know yeah, yeah. exactly. So it was just the Hebrews. Yeah. Actually yeah. explains sort of very nicely where it comes Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, so again, remember, so when you consider historical context, often there, in terms of who's the author, who's the audience, so those are the, those are the investigative questions you're asking. Who wrote it? To whom was it written? Where was it written? What is the occasion? You want to try and establish that. Now, what makes the book of Hebrews actually difficult, because we, you, we are, in that sense it's not the perfect passage, so we don't really know who the author is. We don't really know who the audience is. Um, we don't really know the detail of the occasion. It's not one of the, it's not like often in the New Testament letters where you can go back to the book of Acts, get the historical narrative for it, and, and figure those things out. So that's one way. Book of Acts is often helpful in finding out historical context, or then commentaries would be helpful in understanding that world. But then the other thing that you do, and that's where ultimately where the, the answers that we heard came from, um, is that if you were to read through the book of Hebrews over and over and over and over and over again, trying to answer the question like an investigator, what can I figure out of, of the situation I'll get to now? Then you, would, then you would come to this answer. If you read through the book of Hebrews like an investigator over and over, you would notice Lots and lots of everywhere, um, apart from the title, everywhere throughout the book, there's Old Testament languages, Old Testament imagery, Old Testament um, links that are drawn. You will notice reading through the whole book, the imperatives are calling a people not to, to give up their faith. It is clear throughout the book that they are persecute, persecuted people and that they are precisely persecuted because of their faith in Jesus, and that they are tempted to turn their back on Jesus. It's like, it's so difficult that they think, shouldn't we just maybe go back to just the, the Old Testament stuff? It looks like they're being persecuted by, by probably by, by, by Jewish people. Shouldn't we just revert back to Judaism? Should we just leave the Jesus bit out? And then, you know, pretty much we go on with the same God. That's the temptation. It seems like that is, and if you read through the book, if you read the commentaries, th that much I think is, is you can deduce. Yeah, Zach. Um, just looking at how those sentences, giving away um, our high priest, yeah, yeah. which indicates from Jewish, um, they, in their way, um, so it's, 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 they, that's not it. And it's obviously shorter after, in terms of the timeline, just yeah. after the yeah. same. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's certainly somewhere, it's, it's somewhere between Jesus' first coming and then his, his second coming. It's in the, you know, so it's after, it's after the, I don't know, I don't know how close it is after he's ascended. Where did you see that? Oh, sorry, you know our passage. Yeah. Uh, Um, I'm confused. Four, 14. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Again, we, we're not exactly sure t time wise when that is, but it's certainly, it's, it's, it's certainly, it's, it's certainly past it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. So that's the first thing we do is historical context. Then the second thing that we do is we want to establish the literary context. Okay. Now, with the, 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 the literary context, 
there's um remember what we said earlier you tr we try and establish where does our passage fit into the bigger the bigger argument that the writer of the book of Hebrews is making okay now again so what you what you want to do at this stage you either want to look at a commentary or but before you look at a commentary you want to be you want to be reading through the book and you want to be tracing the argument you know what is what has come before it and what follows after it so can anyone maybe tell us what you know about what's the big argument now we touched on it but what's the big argument of the writer of of the book of hebrews Brilliant. Said lovely there. That's succinct and spot on. It's the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. And how in the book, even up to this point, before our passage, what is the, the means by which he shows the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus? What is, to put it crassly, the technique that the writer is using as he's, as he's um, showing that Jesus is supreme and sufficient? Brilliant. Brilliant. And he does that over and over and over in the book. That's the whole book. If you want to do a sermon series on the book of uh, Hebrews, you have to title it Jesus is Peter. Because that is really the whole the point. Everywhere. So he starts off chapter one, verse one to four. He says it in verse 4, and then he explains it in, in verse 5 to the end of chapter 1, that Jesus is better than the angels. Then after that, he goes on to say in chapter 2, verse 5 to 8, Jesus is the better Adam. Then he goes on in chapter 3, yeah, then chapter 3 to 1 to 6, he says that Jesus is the better Moses. Then, then, in then, and remember, this is literary context. This is just heading up to our passage. Then in the rest of chapter 3, he makes the point that Jesus is the better Joshua leading us into the better promised land. That's the rest of chapter 3 all the way to chapter 4. Then after our passage, we're going to get to ours now, but remember, you're busy with literary context. You're trying to, what is his argument? What's the big flow? After our passage, He's going to be making the point, as was just mentioned, that Jesus is the better priest, chapter 4. Um, and by the way, I'm going to give you all the notes on this, but he's the better priest, chapter 4 uh, to chapter 5. He's going to again focus on Jesus as the better priest in chapter 7. He's going to point out that Jesus is the better priest who brought in the better covenant, uh, chapter 8. Um, and that he brought in the better covenant um, because he went into the better holy place um, with the better sacrifice, which is himself, Hebrews chapter 9, uh, in order to, to sanctify God's people in a better way, chapter 10, um, uh, who, uh, and who... Uh, Thus bringing us to the better Mount Zion. It's going to be his, his next point. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Um, that's why, in a sense, the climax is those well-known words in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, saying Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. So, in a sense, everything is working towards that. So, all through the book, speaking to people who are persecuted, the people that are saying, yes, I think we need to give up on Jesus, because it's, let's just go back to Judaism. He's saying, if you go back to Judaism, it is spiritual suicide. Because everything that you have in the Old Testament is great. It's brilliant. It was necessary. But it was always only a shadow of which Jesus is the reality. And if you forsake Jesus, then you lose Moses. You lose Abraham. You lose the promised land. You lose sacrifice, atonement. holy. You lose everything. Because, because you're going back to a shadow and not the reality. Okay, now that is simply, if you read through the book over and over again, and you can read others that can aid you in that, that is the big argument. And if that is the whole big argument of what came before us and what follows after us, we haven't even looked at our passage. But already, 
you sort of are going to be on the right playing field because you've considered the literary context. Any questions on that? Any thoughts or comments? Any thoughts? It, it almost felt like um, realizing that the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ is sort of the, the literary context. It's almost also the summary of, of the piece we're doing. Yes, it is. It is. Certainly. It is. And, and in that sense, it is. It is a summary in a sense of everything then, because I do think it is the big argument. But remember, you can't, you can't say that then 20 weeks as you preach through Hebrews. You know, so what is, that is, that is ultimately big, the big thing. But what is the specific knife point of that truth in our passage? You know, you know, so somehow our passage is going to be tied up with that big argument that's making that point. But there's a specific edge to the knife point here that we, and that will be your main point. Okay, so, um, right, but we still, we still haven't, we've done the big literary context, but then the immediate literary context is the words, have a look in your Bibles, uh, verse 11 to 13. Remember, you all, I'm sure you'll do this, but you always have to look at the verses just right before your passage. It's very important because he's just saying one thing. So don't miss what, he, what he's been saying. Um, specifically, verse 12 and 13. Well, let me, re, um, somebody read for us, verse 11 to 13. And then, let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must be account. Okay. So, um, actually not easy verses, those. I mean, they're easy, they're well known, especially the, the word as a double is sword. But as soon as you're trying to figure out, okay, but why did the writer say that there? It's quite difficult. Remember, in the, the argument that we've just said now, he's pointing out Jesus is better, he's better than Moses, he's better than Joshua, or he's the better Joshua bringing God's people into the true promised land. Therefore, verse 11 that was just read for us. Let us then, as New Testament believers, strive to enter that rest, the true Sabbath to come, the true promised land to come. Let us strive for that. But then this weird verse is in our context. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing. Like What is going on there? Okay, we don't have time now, so I'm going to speed it up here because I want us to get to the passage. But my guess and others guess is that that when he talks about word of God there which which he also talks in this passage before even as as the gospel or God God's revealing word um, the Israel in the desert on their way to the promised land it also had the word that God spoke to them that was the word at Sinai and that word that God spoke to them at Sinai was was a word that was cutting. It was the word that was always exposing them. It was a word that always, in a sense, showed up them for their unbelief, for their idolatry, for their lack of love. And they always, in, in a sense, were cut to the heart by that word, which they, that left them uh, naked and exposed in the sight of God. That is true of them, and that is, that's the literary context. And so too the Word of God does the same to us today. Us, as New Testament believers, following the true Joshua to the promised land, are a people who are constantly naked and exposed by the Word, always realizing how we fall short, how sinful we are, how broken we are, how idolatrous we are. It's the word that does that naked and exposing work in us. The question is, what do you do? Where do you go 
when you are left naked and exposed by the piercing word of God? Answer Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 16. Now again, sorry, I did that just to, 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 so that we can uh, get done in time. But that's the kind of work that you need to do. You haven't even looked at your passage. You're trying to interpret Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, but we haven't even been in our passage. We've considered the world in which this was written. What is the, what was the, what is the writer being, what, what, what has he been saying up until this point? And you're asking the question, how does my passage fit into what he has said before. And, and then, if you do that, you, 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 at least I've given the answer in a sense, but you would at least at this point saying, we are a people that are left naked and exposed by God's word. That's the last thing that he said. And somehow my passage is going to relate to that. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Any thoughts? Is it unclear? Because then the problem is with me, not you. Any thoughts on that? Do you, you understand why we're doing this? It's really important. Otherwise, you, 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 might, you, you, might have, um, in, you might be interpreting the passage, but it's not actually what the argument is of the writer. It, it does feel like the, the whole book has to be read. Hmm. Yes. Before this even. Lots of times. Yes, or you can take shortcuts and read other guys who have read it lots of times. <laughs> yeah, that's the option. But it's always better if you do it yourself. That's the more exciting thing to do. Oh. Yeah, because yeah. even that 11 starts with let us therefore, referring to Spiffin before. Exactly, exactly. A connective word. Exactly, that's what we said earlier. That's precisely. Check before starts with therefore. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So so you want to, if you got to so that's why connective words can be annoying because you keep going like back like to it can, yeah exactly it just takes you back because it's all, because all all words and clauses and sentences are linked. It's exactly all. All right. Okay. So we need to move on. So what we've done so far, we haven't looked at the passage yet, but we've considered context, historical and literary. Now we get to content. Now in content, we're going to be looking at at least five, because um, I didn't put it in the, the editorial comment one. We're going to look at five tools in, under content in our passage. And I'm going to be asking you to so look at your passage and just shout out the answers as we, as we look at the passage. So let's start off with repetition. In our verses... What words or ideas are being repeated in our, in our three verses? So again, high priest, where? And 15. Great, so you want to highlight that, may or at least indicate that. The, the, the word high priest is in three verses repeated twice, which again doesn't take a rocket scientist. That this passage has got something to do with Jesus as a high priest. Okay, that's it's f fair enough. Great. Other other words, repeated. We. We. We is five times. Great. Brilliant. I didn't even spot that one. It's five times there. What is? Again, let's state the obvious. Why is the word we five times there? He's speaking to. The or a Great. Leaders and not about somebody else. Great. Great. So it is, it is, yeah, brilliant. So he's not speaking of someone else, he's speaking to them. And by the way, most people think the book of Hebrews is not, is not technically a letter, it's a sermon. And it reads like a sermon. It reads like, and, it's, and it says that in the end of the book, uh, the writer re refers to it as my word of exhortation. It's a word of exhortation, it's a sermon. Yeah. Great. Brilliant. Okay, other words that are repeated in. Is that repeated? I missed that. Brilliant. Grace, grace is repeated there twice, twice in one sentence. So again, he's probably emphasizing something there that's important then, namely grace. Wonderful. Any, any other words? 
or receive? Have or receive? Yeah? Awesome. What, what that's 15 and? 14. Yeah, we are, yeah, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, there's, there's a possessive, there's a possessive thing here. We, whoever the we is, which are believers, have, there's, some, there's something that is theirs, and that is Jesus as high priest. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah great. Good. It's not really a repeated word, but it's maybe a, I know it's uh, empath uh, the empathize and and the kind of approachability of God. I don't know, so it's related. Mm. Good. And and I've, if I if I were you, I would scribble that down on my piece of paper. As you remember, we just at this stage you're just scribbling, you're investigating, and that's again, it's not only words; it can be ideas. And so if that stands out. Brilliant. It is. I think you're right. And then the last one there, yes. Great. Brilliant. But that's repeated then. So the let us, the let us, let us is repeated also. Great. We last this exercise one. Exercise is probably only useful with a more direct translation, right? It gets better the more direct your translation is. And that's why I'm saying when you're doing, in, when you're interpreting for the sake of study, you always want to have as direct translation as you can. Because lots of the more um, paraphrasy or, 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 or more interpretive translations, they would often, often they don't have the connective words in. Um, and often because they're trying to make it readable. So they don't want to make it clunky. You want it in a sense clunky when you study it. For yourself, at least, or for others, I think I think so. It is. It's not that it's sin to go for the others, but you're going to miss out on stuff that are actually there in the original, because it's been interpreted away by the by the by the translators. Yeah. Um, so let's let's move on. Connective words. Then, are there any connective words in our three verses? Since. Great. Where? Who said that? Yeah. Since then. Since then. So what is since then? So exactly. So it's again, it's that it's a hinge word, isn't it? So it says to you, my passage is an island on its own. Since then the word of God leaves us naked and exposed in the sight of God. You see what he's so again you you spot the connective word and then you ask. What is the logical flow between this sentence or this or this paragraph and the sentence or paragraph before? That's what that's what you're trying to figure out. But it's the connective word since then that helped us. Okay. Is there any other connective words? Yeah, I don't think no, that's not a connective word. It's, a, it's an important word. Where? Four. Yes. Okay, what is it? What is the for therefore? <laughs> what what is the for? I don't know how to say it differently. It exp so a for is there to e e explain a, a, a concept further. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. St I'm st we're stating obvious stuff, but you want to ask yourself, okay, so how does verse fifteen relate to? To the previous verse, or even to the previous ideas, you, that's what you. That's the question you're asking yourself when you're interpreting. Okay, good. Um, so that is, wouldn't that be considered connected? Let us could draw near to the ground of grace, that we may. Yeah, yeah. That that is a is a it's, well. It gives a purpose. A, it's going to give a purpose clause. And so yes, I think I think that's that's that is one. Yeah, great, brilliant. You're pointing out stuff that I haven't got in my notes. The then is sorry. You're right. You're right. That then is certainly so. Not the let us so much, but the then is certainly it. It is it is certainly a connective word. Apologies. Yeah, that's right. 
Good. So you're looking for all of those. And again, you, you, you're trying to spot them. And then you're asking yourself, what is the, the logical flow of the writer's argument? How do these things fit together? How do they relate to one another? That's what you try and do. Okay. Next, um, we look out for uh, indicatives. What are the indicatives in our passage? Great. Yeah. That's the statement. That's the claim. That's the fact. That's the indicative. Is that we have a great high priest, namely Jesus. Okay. Great, that's, well, more than that, we have a great high priest who have gone through the heavens. That's the claim. That's the statement. That's the indicative. In his name is Jesus, the Son of God. Good. Is there any other indicatives in the passage? Interesting. Yes, where's that? That's my translation that says, therefore, let us never stop trusting him. Yes, is that true? it is. I think that's imperative. We're going to get to that now. Um, I, I mean, I think so. so yes. Uh, wouldn't yes, certainly, certainly. So that's a that's a, a statement that he was tempted in every way, exactly like we were. Yes. That's again imperative. That's a that's in a. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. So then, and, and then just to speed things up, and then last one, we do not have a high priest, priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but, but in every respect tempted as we are. So that's just a, it's a statement. The writer is not, he, he's just, he, he's, he's, he's making a, a claim of the Christian truth, that Jesus was tempted like we are, and that, um, and that he can, so he, they put it negatively there, but he can sympathize with our weaknesses. Okay, that's... that's he did not sin? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yes, yeah, certainly, he, he did not sin. Imperatives. What are then the commands? What are the imperatives? So, the, or in the language of Hebrews, the exhortations. Great. Where's that? Verse 14. There's a let us hold fast to the confession. Okay. And there's another one. Yes. Yeah. So the receiving mercy and draw near is, in a sense, what, what you'll get. But the, but the imperative there is let us then. So, so verse fifteen. Uh, sorry. Um, so so you have in verse fourteen. End of verse fourteen. Let us hold fast our confession. Imperative one. And then exactly the same words that let us, in verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Those are the two exhortations, the two things that the we must do. Okay. So you've got a bunch of truth statements about Jesus. And given those truth statements, the indicatives, there are two imperatives. Let us hold fast to our confession. Let us draw near. Now, the one thing, and that was on the previous thing on page 14, um, the meaning of words. We haven't actually spoken about that. Of course, that's the other thing that you, you need to figure out. What does he mean when he says, let us hold fast to the confession? Now, we don't have the time now to discuss that, unfortunately. But you're going to try and figure that out. You're going to try and see, does the context help me? With, what does he mean by the confession? You're going to read maybe a commentary. You know, I think let us hold to the to fast to the confession is just the confession that Jesus is the Lord, that Jesus is, you know, that he is the, the author and the perfecter of our faith. So it is the, it's the gospel confession. You know, so that's, uh, that's what I think. But you need to go and look that up. Um, all right. So those kind of things you need to figure out in the meaning. Um, are there any metaphors, images, or illustrations? Any Images or illustrations, picture language, and uh, for that. Yeah. that simple type of imagery about falling into the throne of grace. And this, and, 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 and even high priest. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So, priest is, 
of course, it's a, it's a real literal thing. There were priests in the Old Testament, but the way it's used in the New Testament of Jesus is, is, um, uh, is, is, is that it's typology is the technical word for it. Typology is, is that you had Old Testament priests, priests and the, the, it's, a picture of, or it's a picture of what Jesus really is. He's the true priest. It's not that Jesus becomes a kind of priest. He's the original priest. God then instates things like priests in the Old Testament as the shadow of that, the, the reality which is Jesus, which is the priest. So, yeah, so that's picture language. You've got this whole Old Testament story of a people that because of their sin are separated from God. Priest goes and he brings a sacrifice so that there can be atonement. But still only the high priest can go into the presence of God, not the people. But he does that for them. But, but that earthly priest had to do that every single year. It's all of that imagery. Um, who has passed through is that language of going through the curtains. Approaching the throne of grace that was in the, in the most holy place. And it's the most holy place. It's the throne of God. It's the very, it, it communicates the essence of the presence of God which only the priest could go in once a year with fear and trembling and nobody else. You know, so that's all the imagery that, 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 that you get here. Yeah. Great, good. Okay, so... Um, and in a sense, we've done that. So the image, we, we, we've been naughty in a sense, we've been even talking about the, the big story that couldn't help ourselves. Okay, so how does this passage fit into the bigger story? Well, we said that now. Okay. Um, it's, it's, this, it's this language saying, so have a look at that passage there. It's, it, it's a language saying that you, he's saying to these Jewish pe people from a Jewish background, tempted to go back to, to Judaism, he's saying to them, well, you know, all that stuff about priests, atonement that needs to happen so that people can be in relationship with God. All of that was really the shadow, and Jesus is the true, ultimate, great high priest. Um, and that Jesus is a high priest who went into the real, most holy place. He went through the heavens into that, and he's going to say this in Hebrews 10, into the, into the very presence of God. And he went in there, and what does it say? Um, Uh, yeah, so, so, and, so and he went, he, he went in there as the, as the Son of God. He went in there as the, the, into the heavenly. So when he died on the cross, he went into the heavenly throne, grew, uh, th throne room to make um, atonement once for all, as the, the language is going to say later in the book of Hebrews. That's what Jesus did. Um, so he's in a sense communicating Jesus's divinity as a high priest there's a uniqueness of him unlike the other high priest he only went in once he went into the very presence of god you know and and he brought atonement once and for all i mean this is going to be his argument later on in the book so but but it's pointing out of jesus divinity and then he sort of goes on and he talks here in a sense of jesus in a sense also this is humanity almost he's a high priest who doesn't sympathize with our weakness he was tempted just like us but without sin, but he was tempted like us. Um, so he's picking up all those Old Testament stories. So, because we've only got 10, 10 minutes left. So you've done all this work now, okay? You've, you've, you've looked at the context. You've considered the, the indicatives, the imperatives, the repetition, connective words, images, big story. Remember, we're trying to work towards, we're trying to work towards What's the big idea or what is the main point of our passage? Okay. As you've done this work, does anyone, this is now the time. I think you want to, you want to consider all the various bits and you want to look at it and you want to try and say, okay, but, but what is this passage? What is this passage communicating? What is it, what, what is it saying? Does anyone want to have a stab at it in your own words? Um, how would you take those, the, the, those concepts together and saying, well, this is, um, you, know, the, the, you know, this is what it is saying. It's not supposed to be 
Yes, supposed to be only one sentence. Now, of course, it does. It, it never just starts off with one sentence. It's probably going to start off with two or three sentences, and you're going to try and distill it. You want to try and get to the essence of it. But it is helpful to distill it to one sentence for the sake of clarity. Um, anyone wants to give it a go? It's very difficult to do this on the spot in five minutes. This often, if I do sermon prep, will take me a day to do this, do this whole part. Um, Jesus, the great high priest, who opened the way for us. Great. I like that. I like that. I would want to add to that. It feels to me there's important bits there. I know, I know you imply it. So I know that you, but, but I think, yeah, I, I would want to add a bit to it. But that's just me. Might be wrong. Yes. Um, that we are not alone in going to do this. We have to go to the Great. Not great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> great. Great. Listen, by the way, I'm not sitting here with the right answer, and this is guess Johan's right answer. I don't. So all of this, in a sense. I, I like that too. All of this, and it says, this is this is what you do when you're trying to interpret. This is, you know, this is this is exactly what you do. You do this over and over again, and then you're going to look at that. You're going to look at that, and you say, initially, oh, it feels right, but oh, I'm still missing that. How does this take into account the context here, or how does this actually take into account the imperatives that are on the passage, or how does it act? You know, so you, you and you're going to do this over and over and over and over. This is this is the burden of trying to, to interpret. John. We have continuous, continual access to the throne of grace. Brilliant. I like that. I like that. That's that. That's a good one. That's a good one. And there's and there's a, and there's different. There will be again my big idea and yours. It won't be exactly the same. But if we all do this exercise, we're going to be driving on the same highway. We might be in slightly different lanes, but we'd be going in the same direction. And that's in a sense, I think, you know, but. But we might just emphasize something slightly differently. But I like that one. Yes. Say again, Jesus. Yes. Good. Good. I like that. I do think. I do think it's helpful in a main point. This is my opinion. So this is not like law, I do think it's helpful to try in your main point to try and work in the, 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 the imperative. So what, do you, what is the response that, that this message is? Because remember, this is what you're going to be communicating. And it's helpful if you can put that in there already, incorporate it. It just helps. It, it, it's, it, it clarifies it for you to make sure that it's, you're not just teaching, but you're actually um, calling people, you're exhorting people. Yes, did you? I'm repeating what I was Oh, sorry, sorry. I was thinking something along the lines of um, that Jesus is our only hope for salvation and that we can only come to him because he is the greatest high priest. I like that. I like that. S say it again. Je Jesus is our only. Can you say that again? Uh, I think so. Um, Oh. I, I liked it. I just want to make sure. I, um, I just kept thinking of the scripture that says that, um, that salvation is in Christ alone. Yeah. So that um, closely the red light priest who is able to sympathize with us is yeah. the only one who can come to the greatest yeah. high priest. Yeah. Great. Good. I liked it. I liked so it. One more just after that is the grace force. Yes. Through the grace. Through the grace. Great. Good. Good. Um, let us not forsake our faith in, in Jesus because he's faithful. Yes, that, I like that. That's, and I like the play with the word of faith there. Um, brilliant. So, but but what, I like, what I like about that one, I would probably with the word faithful, even though it works nice with faith, um, it does feel to me like that's in essence what he's saying. He's in a sense saying... Um, because of these indicatives, 
you know, there's, there's something that you call to. Because Jesus has done something, there's something that we can do. It feels to me like that's, there's, a, there's a balance to what he's saying there. Now, how you word that, you know, but he is saying there, um, and I would want to work in the context, because the context I think is important to how I would be shaping my main idea. The context is, we are a people who are left naked and exposed in the sight of God by the word of God. That's the context. Feels to me, our passage is answering, what do I do when I feel naked and exposed by the word of God in the sight of God? What do I do? It feels to me like the passage is then saying, well, because this is true of Jesus, this is what you do. Because Jesus is a high priest, he's gone through the heavens, he's better than earthly high priest because he's God, he actually sorted out the big thing there, and he was fully man, so he totally understands our sin. So he's that kind of perfect priest, both in his divinity and his humanity. Because he's that kind of priest, what you do is you can hold fast, we should hold fast, even when you feel like, oh, I've messed up, I've sinned, um, look, look, I'm so naked and exposed. I feel I just want to hide like Adam and Eve from God when they felt naked. That's how I feel. Whew, I've got a priest. And he sorted out everything in the heavens. And he knows how difficult temptation is. So I feel naked and exposed. I want to run like Adam and Eve. I can hold fast. I can hold fast to him. I don't have to give up on him. In fact, I don't only hold fast, I can approach the throne of grace. There's grace for me. So, but you see, see how important the context is. It's the context that, that helps you to... Now, again, I don't know what exactly my main sentence is, but it's something about priests, it's something with the exhortations, and it's given whatever the literary context is. I'll get to it like this now. Yeah. Shame. You can confidently hold fast onto Jesus, our great high priest. Brilliant. I like that. There's a sermon for you. Uh, yeah, something like that. Now, again, we might have slightly, you might emphasize certain bits, given your congregation, given what's happening in your own life. But we're going to be somewhere there about showing Jesus as better, given his mediation work, his atoning work. Something about that. And you're going to be calling people to say, you don't have to, you don't have, you don't have to be, you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to run away. You don't have to give up on Jesus. You can, you, you can cling to him and you can come to him all because of him. Something like that. Your sermon is going to be somewhere there. It will be a brilliant sermon. And then, and then, now we're going to stop now. We're going to stop. We've got two minutes. Um, and I'm going to hand you out a bit of what we've spoken about tonight. You'll get this um, and you can go look at it again. But in a sense, so... So, uh, I mean, my, my main point was very similar. I said here, the shame of our sin need not cause us to fall away from God because in Jesus we have a perfect mediator. I just use mediator because it's slightly easier language than priest, but priest is probably closer. But so I was, uh, something like that would be my main idea. And then back to what we said in the beginning, and I'll close with this. You write your main idea. You've done, you've taken the tools You've, you've worked hard, and this sometimes takes a day for me, eight hours, to get to this. And then when I, got, when I get to that main idea, and I can write it on a piece of paper, I write it on a piece of paper, and I put it there in my study, and I stand far away from it. And I look at that big, now I don't want to be cluttered by the detail. I've spent hours and hours looking at the, I've looked at the tree and at all the leaves on the tree. Now I want to look at the wood. Uh, at the wood. So I'm standing back and I've got the main idea. And then I'm asking myself, okay, if this is the big idea, if this is the main point, if this is what God is saying, he's saying to me and he's saying to the people I'm ministering to, you don't have to be ashamed when you are confronted with your sin. Because of Jesus, you can come to God and you can, there's grace for you. Something like that. Then I ask myself, okay, how am I in, it, in my message or my Bible study? How am I going to introduce that idea? And how am I going to show them that that is what the passage is saying and not what I'm saying? Because I haven't got a word for the people. God has got a word for the people. So I'm showing them what God is saying. And then I'm trying to 
explain maybe the words that they don't know. I'm trying to illustrate it in a way, maybe saying, you know, you know there was, you know, you, you try and illustrate a way that people can, can understand it. You think of illustration and you try and apply it. You say, and this is for you. You sitting here today, and again, you've fallen for the thousandth time in pornography. And you're like, you totally just have to hide from God. It's been the thousandth time that you've fallen in pornography. Example, if you're speaking with high school kids or, or men, just in general. Then you say, that's how you feel. You feel like this. It's good news for you. Because of who Jesus is, divine but fully human priest, what he's done on the cross, as a priest for us, because of that, you can hold fast. You're going to make it. And you can come. There's grace on tap. You can get grace on tap on and on and on and on, not because you deserve it, but because of Jesus. That's your sermon. You apply it to them. You speak it to them. And, that's, and that is, that's what we do. Okay. I'm going to stop there. So, in your sermon, why not just unpack the whole process Say again, how, why don't you? Uh, why don't you walk your audience through your whole process of going through the message? Because it's, um, yeah. Yeah, you, 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 you want to do it to some extent. Because we don't only want to teach people, we, we, we don't only want to fish for them, but we want to teach them to fish. So it helps in that way. But if you do too much of that, then you're teaching and you're not preaching. It's a slightly different exercise. So there's a time and place in a Bible study, it's a bit better. But that's a balance and a debate on how you, how you strike the balance. Someone please pray for us. Say thank you to the Jesus who has um, given us grace on tap. We will pray for us. So